Thank you all for joining our webinar today. This is, I believe, our seventh Lunch and Learn webinar. I'm starting to lose track now, but I think it's our seventh. So we try to do these every month and therefore our, um, our DBE clients. So our DBE certified businesses enrolled in the DBE supportive services program. Um, so again, this one's all about RFQs, also known as Request for Qualifications. And it's an introductory level webinar. It's going to be fairly brief. It's meant to be short during your lunch break so we don't take up too much of your time. And if you want to dive deeper into the topic in any way, Liz Brazil, who is today's presenter, is always available um, for scheduling one-on-one -on -one sessions with her. So she can dive deep into your individual situation, learn more about your business, and answer any questions you have. Um, right off the bat, I just want to take care of a few housekeeping items. Number one is that this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available to view on our website and our YouTube channel within about a week of today. Um, questions, we're going to save those till the end, so make sure to write them down, or there's also a chat box feature. Um, you can use, you can type your questions in that chat box, and then we'll save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end if anyone has any questions. Um, but we do love to answer questions, so please feel free to, you know, gather your questions. We want to talk to you guys at the end, and we'll be sure to save time for those. Um, the third thing is that I will be sending out all the slides to this webinar along with Liz Brazil's contact information afterwards, probably within a day or two as follow-up. So you'll be receiving all the slides, no need to take copious notes um, and Liz's information if you want to schedule one-on-one -on -one sessions with her. Okay, Liz, you can change the slide. So we're gonna briefly introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Taylor Bowes. I'm the DBE Supportive Services Northern Region Program Administrator. And Liz Brazil is our DBE bid specialist who will be presenting today's webinar. Liz, do you want to give a short introduction? Um, I've been a um, DBE bid specialist now and I've been helping out different types of clients. Um, I'd just like to say something about myself. I've been fortunate to work for 35 years with various transportation agencies, um, helping deliver capital projects and programs throughout the Bay Area. All right. Okay, so next, um, I'm just gonna give a really brief overview of DBE Supportive Services Program. Um, some of you I know have been joining um, a lot of our monthly webinars, which is great, that's what we want. Um, but you've probably heard this spiel a million times by now, so I apologize for that. Um, so this is kind of a short list of what we do in a nutshell. Uh, we put out a monthly DBE newsletter to all DBE certified firms in Northern California. It also goes to our list of prime partners, um, public agency partners, and so on. Um, we do these Lunch and Learn webinars. So once a month, and we do topics relevant to DBEs. Um, on that note, if any of you guys ever have any ideas for topics that you'd like to hear about, please let us know, because we're always um, wanting new ideas for what we can present about. Um, we also subscribe to an online training website called govology.com. Um, it costs us money to subscribe. It's an annual subscription, and then you all get to use our code for free. So there's hundreds of online trainings related to government procurement on this website. Um, they range from like $50 to $200 a piece, and you can view them for free. If you don't already have that access code, um, please ask us and we can share it with you. We also do a DBE blog. So all of our specialists kind of take turns um, writing articles about different topics relevant to DBEs, and those are posted on our website and in our monthly newsletters. We also put on contractor workshops and those are put on by, um, by our public works and construction specialist. His name is Ed Duarte. He also does a lot of these monthly webinars. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one counseling 
So you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one session with any of our specialists at any time. They all use an online scheduling website, so it's really easy for you just to click on the link, schedule a session when it works for you, and then they'll give you a call at whatever time you choose. Um, lastly, we provide business plan assistance. So we have business planning specialists who will work with you to either update your existing business plan or create a new one. And now I'll hand it over to Liz and she will jump right into the presentation. And again, welcome everybody. Today's objective is to learn the components of the RFQ and how to respond. There are many different types of procurement, such as request for proposals, invitation for bids, request for qualifications. This overview will cover Caltrans RFQ notice for federally funded projects. Before we get started, I wanted to show you the Caltrans procurement and contracts website where the A&E information is located. This is where you could obtain currently advertised A&E projects. So let's go there. And when you get into the AME Procurement Contracts website, you will see a listing of uh, projects that's currently advertised. This was um, advertised on November 27th and it's due on uh, December 26th. And of course, if you want to get more information about advertised projects, you can go on Cal e Procure. So let's click in here. This is engineering construction inspections, testing, claims, and constructability support services. So when you get into that information, you'll receive information about the event ID, the published date as mentioned is November 27th, the due date, which is December 26th, which is right after Christmas, and it also has information about the contract administrator. And for this solicitation, Caltrans is solicitating statement of qualifications from qualified firms that may lead to the award of agreement for A&E on-call engineering construction inspection testing claims. The estimated contract amount is 4 million to 6.5. Here's the listing of the UNSP classification description. And if you click on the event package, you will get the actual RFQ. And this is what we're going to be covering today. So again, uh, the RFQ is very similar because there's a standard boilerplate for all RFQs. And I will go over those components. and. Briefly, here's the date, the RFQ number. Um, it has the general information. It also has the negotiation period, where it's going to be located. And also, because this is federally funded, there's a DBE goal of 13%. And further down, there's the scope deliverables, which is in attachment I or 1. And also in here, it would have information about submission statements. So let's go back to our presentation. And if you need more information on how to find contracting opportunities, you can review our prior Lunch and Learn webinar. It was held on November 20th, and it will go through the different types of locations where you could get currently advertised projects and also 12 months look ahead. So components of an RFQ. The format and composition of RFQ is mandated by Federal Acquisition Regulation, which is commonly referred to as FAR, and FDA Circular 4220.1F. This is the third-party contracting guidance. This set of rules is very lengthy and defines what must go into the RFQ and how it must be structured. This format of the RQ may be different from other government agencies, but the contents are basically the same. RFQ information identifies the title of the procurement, as I've shown earlier, the procurement number, 
state of advertisement, the DBE growth, which we just saw was 13% and many more. As part of this presentation, I'd like to share useful tips. My tip for this slide is to obtain background information and research the project. Get the project fact sheet and review the project study reports if there's any. General in information. In submitting your statement of qualifications, you need to comply with instructions of this section. It includes estimated contract amount, estimated contract term date, procurement and interview schedule, the DB program, the point of contact, delivery of proposal, and there's even a sample contract included and also information about agency rights and other instructions. And the tip for this one is note, um, proposal deadline. It's very important that you do not submit your uh, proposal late. It will be returned and open and deemed non-responsive. Pre-proposal meeting, I highly encourage that you attend this because it gives you an opportunity not only to learn about the project, but also to meet with other prime contractors and the project manager for this project. Interview date, uh, make sure that your key personnel is available. The mission of proposal, follow the content and format instructions and sign all forms. Check for addenda and sign acknowledgement of the form. This is very important. Okay, now we're getting into submission of statement of qualifications. This includes the proposal format and content requirements and how the material need to be organized. Format includes document size, the page limitations, if any, proposal format, like the number of printed electronic submittals, and also the content, list all of the required forms, proposer's firm profile, firm and staff qualification, the work plan, and proposed schedule and staffing plan. Cost pricing and separately sealed envelope is required for A&E contracts. And of course, the DBE information. The statement of qualification package submittal instructions. Um, and here are some tips. Use this section as your checklist for what to include in your proposal. Check it multiple times to be sure that you haven't left anything out, especially required forms. Okay, our next topic. Scope and work deliverables. This section describes the work to be performed. It provides the program overview and project requirements. A scope or work deliverables include at minimum the purpose of work, the location of work, required services, personnel requirements, general requirements, license requirements, and deliverables. And my tip for this is review this section thoroughly. If you are the successful proposer, you will be required to provide the services identified in this section. Proposer must address how they intend to deliver the necessary services. Okay, the next slide is the evaluation process. A contract administration or the project manager conducts responsiveness reviews to ensure all submittal requirements are met. The panel review member scores both the technical review of the proposal and the interview based on the established criteria of the RFQ. The tip, the panel review members are comprised of subject matter experts. They can be uh, project managers within the agency, or they could be project managers from other agencies, including Caltrans. Proposals that lack the detail and depth will not score well. So I would be cautious and ensure that you have all the details necessary to um, for this 
uh, scope of work. Evaluation criteria defines the factors, sub-factors, and elements used to score the proposal. Normally consists of two parts. So the first part is the technical evaluation criteria, your proposal. And the second part is the interview. And our tips for this is review the evaluation criteria to understand the areas of importance based on the weighted scores. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, your firm had been ranked as top of the half of the proposals and had been selected to the end of your process. Now what? You may be limited to the number of people invited. Ensure that you select your team accordingly, who can be the most asset to your team. Make sure that you have a cohesive team. Practice. I can't emphasize how important to practice with your team. You have a very limited time in setup and may your time in your presentation may take time in your presentation. So uh, make sure that you um, get the information well in advance. How much time do I have to set up? How many team members can I bring? Uh, how many, you know, um, what necessary equipment do you have in order to do my presentation? So there's a lot of things that you have to consider when you um, have been selected to the next of the procurement process. Okay, this one is um, very important. There's a lot of mandatory forms and documents. RFQs often require many forms and documents to be responsive. This include addendums, levying act, federal requirement forms, VB forms, and if you've not met the goal for this project, you have to provide good faith effort documentation. Um, of course, the cost, uh, cost proposal, sometimes you have to have a specific form um, in order to provide your cost proposal, and this is going to be dictated by the RFQ. For more information about the required forms, you can go to the A&E Forms and Instructions. And if you want to get details about Caltrans selection process and forms, you can also review the Local Assistance Procedure Manual. Chapter 10, there's a link here, and also it has the forms that's required. A tip for here is read it carefully. If you forget to submit required information, you run the risk that your proposal will be deemed non-responsive. Is there a DBE goal? If so, has your firm met the goal or provided good faith effort? It's also important that you make sure that the subcontractor that you're listing as a DBE is certified as a DBE for that type of work. And here are a couple of useful tips that I wanted to share with you. Follow the format suggested in the RFQ using the same section headings to ensure that all requirements are covered. Avoid using a proposal as an opportunity to point out flaws in the agency's existing program, unless it is necessary to do so in order to describe the benefits of your proposal. Proposals should be solution-oriented. Omit marketing collateral. And here's some more. Exceptions to the contract terms and conditions may be stated in the proposal. However, avoid imposing conditions on the agency. Conditions may make it difficult for an agency to accept a proposal. Understand all insurance and indemnity requirements. Define any acronyms used and refrain from using technical jargon. The proposal should not be overly complicated. And lastly, clearly state any assumptions that are made in preparing a proposal. And since this is our last tip, um, I'd like you guys to consider using an internal proposal checklist. You know, check. Everyone involved in creating the proposal has read the RFQ requirements. Check it out. Secondly, the proposal meets 
all the requirements. Check it off. Very requested copies of proposal have been made. This is an easy mistake. If they request five copies, hard copies, make five hard copies. If they request in addition that you make electronic submittal, you have to have a very specific naming convention. You gotta submit it in a file and follow the instructions. The number of printed electronic copies of the proposal have been prepared. Check it off. Don't rely on one person. The proposal clearly identifies the proposer, contact information, project name, and RFQ number. The proposer's name, RFQ number, and project title appear on the proposal shipping package or envelope. You don't want it to get lost in the mailroom. It's very important that you have it identified. Ensure the accurate and timely shipping or mailing stated in RFQ. Uh, for the one of agency I have worked for, we received some RFPs, RFQ proposals two days or three days late. And unfortunately, those were returned unopened. Okay, with that, I'm going to close out my presentation. It's a brief overview, and I just wanted to share with you that if you'd like to have a more extensive overview, you can set up a, a consultation and you can reach me at www.calendly.com slash list underscore Brazil. And Taylor will provide you with that information of how to contact me. And with that, we're going to open it to Q&A. Thank you, Liz. You're welcome. Does everybody have any questions? That was a, um, a very brief kind of quick overview, but it does give um, a good idea, I think, of you know what's all involved in an RFQ, what's the best way to respond to it. <clears throat> I think the gist is just um, oftentimes with these RFQs, there's gonna be multiple deadlines and that checklist that Liz showed at the end, um, each item in that checklist should probably also have sub items. So it's just really important that right away, um, you calendar all the deadlines, you have a team in place of who's gonna look over the RFQ and help respond. Um, I know some of you are very small, so you have really small teams but at least one other person is a really good idea. Um, and then um, all, all the information you need to provide within the RFQ, just right away, you know, make, make those each titles and make sure that you're filling in all that information. Um, and those can be sub items on that checklist. Another tip I would like to offer is sometimes if you have a very specific scope of services, you can actually prepare in advance a template a proposal to submit where you just have to fill in certain portions of it. Um, so most of the format are basically the same. So if you prepare a template or a boilerplate, that will expedite your um, composition of your proposal. Any questions? Is anybody working on any RFQs that you had a specific question about? Let me just say quickly that you're all muted, so you need to unmute yourself if you want to speak or you can use the chat box. Okay, um, so I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, so I think we'll just go ahead and end it here. Thank you all so much for joining the webinar today. Um, again, I will reach out sometime today or tomorrow with the slides for this webinar and Liz's information that you can use to follow up with her.
to have one-on-one -on -one sessions. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.